Church, can we rise? Let's read the Bible together, even as we go into God's word together this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. All right, can you guys hear me? I need some feedback. Not only do I have feedback, I, I need some feedback. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, are you there in scriptures? John chapter 1 verse 17, very quickly. And then we we'll go from John and then we we'll do Luke um, very quickly. I think that will really help us. Uh, Luke 23 and then we we'll read 39 to 43. Uh, ask your neighbor what was the last time you read the book of John? I know they will smile. If they are not smiling, they are guilty. If they are smiling, they are also guilty. If they are speaking, then they are not guilty. All right. John chapter 1 verse 17, the Bible says, For the Lord was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, But the Lord was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through even Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's do Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. Are you there? Luke should be before the book of... Do we still say that to people these days? Uh, because you are using smartphones, you just know where it is. All right, Luke 23, and then we'll read um, verses 39 to 43. Luke 39, Luke 23, 39 to 43. The Bible says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? See, you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward for our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong then he said to jesus look at what he said to jesus and it's very important he said to jesus lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus response was assuredly i say to you today you will be with me in paradise can we call us that together Today, you be with me in paradise. For a few minutes this morning, I'm going to be sharing on what I've titled, Grace is Greater. Look at him and say, Grace is Greater. No, you're not sure. The way you're saying is like you're sleepy. <laughs> I like that. Look at somebody and say, Grace is Greater. Father, thank you because the entrance of your word always give light, give understanding to us simple folks. Father, we have come to learn at your feet and make my tongue the pen of every writer. And I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let us walk according to your counsel for our lives. Sir. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, and amen. amen. And amen. amen. I believe, God, that the end of September would have AC and WAP generator in this church. And I'm saying it to you. Because I should say it. And I've been telling myself, I wish, am I going to say it? But I've said it. I've, I've said it. So you can mark it down that I said it. At the end, this at the end of this month, you won't come to this church. Uh, I've been to sweat because God will have finished what He has started. Look at him and say, "I see finished what the Lord has finished." Please, as reality that you are be seated in God's presence. Have you really considered what we just read in scriptures, especially from the book of Luke? A criminal. The Greek call him a kakugos. Who is that? Who is a kakagos? Scripture says he's an evil doer. Someone who does evil. Someone who always and always does evil. An evil worker. A malefactor. Mark called him a thief. Yet Jesus said to him today, you will be with me in paradise. I mean, he had not done anything. Please, don't be distracted. Listen to me. I mean, he has not done anything, whether good or bad. And Jesus said to him, today, you will be with me in paradise. Only thing he did, the scripture says, was that this young man actually said, remember me, O Lord, when you get to your kingdom. So he called Jesus Lord. That's the first thing. So he said, you are Lord. And then the second thing is that he acknowledged that Jesus had the kingdom. And he said, when you get to your kingdom, please remember me. But that's what he said. As scripture says, the man said to him, and I love this. Jesus looked at that man and said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Simply spoken, that is grace. He has not done anything bad, good. All his life he has done bad. 
The Bible calls him a kakugos. Somebody who consistently does evil. Somebody who is criminal. And yet, Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not know a better way to describe grace than this. Than what I just described to you in scriptures. The rational mind cannot get it. Grace is unfair. And that's what we just saw. And that's grace. Can I say to you again that grace is not fair? Grace is simply God. Are you angry that that man will make heaven? I was personally angry when I read that scripture. I don't know whether you are like me, but I was very angry. A thief. Mark called him a thief. A criminal. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. At least let him come down from that tree and let him do some good. How about the people he has stolen from? What happened to probably he had even killed somebody? Bible called him a condemned criminal. Yet yeah, Jesus said today you will be with me in paradise. You don't get it. So I'm going to explain it to you with another story. Stories are good because we get stories. I want to show you and I want to tell you. Am I the reason I'm getting feedback? I'm the reason, right? Because this is facing me. Please turn it away. Apologies. Amen. Amen. All right. I will not be a prisoner. I will move around. All right. Okay, that's fine. It's okay. Thank you. I'm grateful. All right. That's your I just means I'm grateful. All right. So let's go on. Let me share another story with you. And this story would actually just bring the points. And I think after this story, I'll say some things and then we'll be ready to go home. <laughs> Is that powerful? Let me explain grace to you by telling you the story of another criminal. A true story of another criminal. The name of the man is Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, write that name down. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Write that name down. You need that name. You need that man. Jeffrey Dahmer. Why am I saying you write it down? Because a day will come that the devil will tell you that you cannot receive that thing. You will need that name to remind yourself that you are good enough to receive the best of God. The man's name is Jeffrey Dahmer. When the devil tells you you are not good enough to have the blessings of God, I mean, if I ask you right now, I know you guys are seated before me. I take away the slide. Take away the slide. Don't jump my message. I said, put the picture. That's all I said. Thank you. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. If I ask you who is the most wicked person you know in your life, or that you have heard of, the most wicked of them all, please. Find a name for yourself. Don't tell me, but find a name for yourself. I know some people will say, I've, I've read of Adolf Hitler. Some people will talk about Mussolini. Some people will talk about Mobutu Seseko. Some people will talk about General Sani Abacha. All right? These are names of people. But some of you right now are thinking of your stepmothers. Some of you right now are thinking of that person that abused you. And it's okay. So, some of you are thinking of that landlord. That you don't know any man more wicked than that guy. All right? Some of you are thinking of that boss that you work with that time. But ladies and gentlemen, no matter the name you have right now in your head, I want to suggest to you that I've found someone who is more wicked. He's the prince of wickedness. Jeffrey Dahmer, the dear devil himself, the prince of wickedness. He's also known as the Milwaukee cannibal or the Milwaukee monster. He was an American serial killer and sex offender who killed and dismembered during his lifetime 17 males. Sorry, this is a, these are stops of horror movies, but this actually happened. 17 males between 1978 and 1991. Many of his late mothers include what you call necrophilia. What is necrophilia? It is when people have sex with dead, dead bodies. You are getting it. He was involved in cannibalism and the permanent preservation of body parts, typical all part of the skeleton. He was diagnosed with some personal disorder. That's what you think, that this guy cannot be okay. But actually, when he was facing trials, he was medically tested to be sane. He was convicted 
of 17 murders. 11 corpses were found in his apartment. He cut off arms. He ate body parts. At his trial, his face was frozen. There was no emotion. There was no remorse. It was just the stuff of movies. But Jeffrey Dahmer was a real guy. And when he was in prison, Jeffrey Dahmer met with Christ. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And for the first time, Jeffrey Dahmer said he was sorry for those acts he committed. Jeffrey Dahmer received grace. He became sin washed, souls cleansed. His past totally forgiven. Though he was later beaten to death by an inmate. Somebody said that serves him right. But he died a saved man. Yet, Jeffrey Dahmer died having met the Christ. If the thief and Dama can find grace, why won't you? Why will God not give it to you? Why will God not give you grace? And that leads me. Am I the only one hearing that sound? It's not only me, right? Can you off all the equipment and leave what I'm saying alone? The word grace was mentioned in the Bible. So, I, I'm just going to speak about what grace is. But how many of you love the story of Jeffrey Dahmer? Criminal. Yet he met God. The word grace was mentioned in the Bible 159 times. And 122 times in the New Testament alone. God divine grace as unmerited favor. And I'm sure you have heard that word definition that grace is unmerited favor. But I don't think you understand that. Let me explain it to you in a way that you will like it. Grace is unmerited favor. That means that everything you have, you do not deserve to have them. Now, we have a screen just behind me. How many of you will not run out with chills if your life it's being played on this screen right now. The last 10 years of your life. Some of the things you have done. Some of the things you thought you did. Some, some of them played right now on the screen. screen. How would you feel? Some, some of you, you um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, including, including those periods of masturbating. I, I mean, including those periods of um, lying to that guy. All of it on the screen right now. Many of you will run out of this church and you will not come back to this neighborhood. I thought you said you were better than Jeffrey Dahmer. Everything, therefore, that you receive from God, you cannot say you deserve it because you did right. You got it because of his unmerited favor. That, I tell you, is the definition of grace. Number two, what is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It means that everything you will ever receive, you will receive it because of what Jesus had done. It's why we call it the riches of Christ, the riches of God at the expense of Christ. It means that Jesus made it available for you and to you. Anything you got, you got because of Jesus. I mean including that job. Including that thing you are complaining about. You got it, uh, not because you prayed. You see, we have come we become a people who have deified prayer. We make prayer seems to be like an end in itself. Prayer is not the end in itself. Uh, prayer is just accessing God. Without Christ, you will get nothing. Therefore, grace uh, is the riches of Christ. That means everything Jesus made available. Everything that was available, we call it so-so. True salvation is yours because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Number three. What is grace? Grace is the ultimate ability of God displayed upon man. Somebody say, you know I'm weak. I can't do that thing by myself. When grace comes, you become able. Grace gives you ability. How, have you read the story of Samson in scriptures? A man took gates by himself and, and walked away with it. Can you take the gate of the church by yourself and walk away with it? 
But he did that. Why? Because God's ability came upon his life. There is something called the ability of God. There is something called the grace of God. If it comes upon your life, it is the difference maker. I found out that the difference between those who made it and those who did not make it is not intelligence, it is grace. If somebody listen to what I'm saying, if you get this, it will change your life forever. Listen, I've listened and I've sat down and listened to some men of God. And I hear what they preach and I see how many thousands are, are listening to them and I say, what is he saying? Baba Deboye sit down on a chair and he speaks and five million people come. If care is not taken, you will sleep off listening to him. But the reason you don't sleep off is because you know grace is being communicated. Listen, try and start a church. I've seen a generation says, you know, church is the way you, you cash out. Try and start a church. And see whether 10 people will come after one year. When, they, when you see that, the riches of Christ that is made available. What is grace? Grace is God's mystic formula for meeting our needs. Grace is the way by which God meets your need. Did you, you came to church today with a need. Then I tell you that grace is the answer. You came to church this morning and you are saying, you know what? How shall this thing be? Grace is the answer. Help me look at him and say, grace is the answer. What is grace? The G is God. And then you have the race. God in your race. Grace is God in your race. What is grace? Grace is divine empowerment. Grace is divine empowerment. That's what grace is. Grace, and I love this, this last one. When the Lord gave me this, I smiled. Everybody look at me. Eyeball to eyeball. I want you to get this. Grace is divine embellishment. And I explain it. Have you seen a lady before on their wedding day? Even when it's not their wedding day, they are just what do you call them now? Co-celebrants. Or people who are just happy that some people are getting married. They are well wishers, praise God. And then you see them on the wedding day and you cannot find any of the pimple on their face anymore. The black spots are gone. Say, baby, you are fresh. She's not fresher than you. She has eaten it. It's eaten. How does she do that? It is embellished now. The weakness, the dark spot is covered now. Let me say this to you. When grace comes upon your life, the dark spot is covered now. The weakness is covered now. The, the, the weakness is covered now. The pain is covered now. The art is covered now. The things that were supposed to count against you is covered now. It's called the grace. When God says do something and you are telling him, can't you see my weaknesses? He's saying you don't understand my grace. When God says go ahead and get something done. And you're saying I can't get ahead and get it done. God is saying, you don't understand my grace. Listen, dear friends, you need to study women. Because if you can understand how that process of makeup happens, you can understand how God makes you spiritually every day. Because grace is not only what we define. Grace is also a person. Grace is the person of Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and then verse 14, Scripture says of his fullness, Have all received. No, that's the thing. Of his fullness, have all received grace for grace. And verse 17 says, The Lord came through Moses. But grace and truth came through our Lord Jesus Christ. The person of Christ is the person of grace. Therefore, when Jesus said, I am with you, the name Emmanuel is a guarantee of grace. Emmanuel is not a name of a church, it's a guarantee that grace will cover you. You may, not have, you may not have what others have, but grace will cover you. Somebody came to church and your mistakes are shouting. Your pains are shouting to you. Your past is shouting to you. But Jesus is in your world. Don't look at the storm, look at grace. Because Jesus is in your world. That's why he called himself Emmanuel. God 
with us. But in my sojourn, I found out that many believers and many people in this world have an understanding of what grace is. But why is it that they don't walk in grace? And why are they not gracious? I want to tell you about four kinds of people you will meet on the surface of the earth. And they are probably in church even this morning. The first set of people, number one, the first set of people are the people I call the hedonist. Have you heard the word hedonist before? That speaks of people who live their life for pleasure. They do not care about other things other than pleasure. I love it, I go for it. I love it, I get it. For them, there is no moral standard. Their moral standard is self. In as much as it pleases them, then it is good. In as much as it pleases them, it is good. Their God is self. They worship at the feet of pleasure. Somebody say, you know what? I want to have three some. And I want it, and I'm going to get it. Why? No more stand. He worship at the feet of self. Somebody say, I can take that money. It is not mine. And he's going to do it. How and why? He worship again at the feet of self. Somebody say, you know what? I can just change some figures at my place of work. And nobody will know. And then I'll have more money to buy a new car, to do new things. He worship at the feet of self. Somebody say, you know what, I can use my sister or use a girl that comes to me or I carry a girl from TikTok and I use her for money with one baba somewhere. You call it Yahoo Stover. Why is that guy doing it? For the sake of flesh and self. He just wants pleasure. Not intrusive. him. Not intrusive. her. Just pleasure. Bible says, Paul writing concerning people like that, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 4, he said they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The writer of Proverbs spoke about them. 21, 17 Proverbs. He says, he who loves pleasure will be poor. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. I didn't say that. Scripture say that. I love Isaiah 5 verse 11. The Bible says, whoa. And this is why I don't drink. If you want to know why I don't drink, it's in the scripture there. Scripture says, woe to those who rise early in the morning. That they may pursue strong drink. Who stay up late in the evening that they may inflame themselves with wine. That word woe is what cause. They misbehave. It is not good, O oh kings, for kings uh, even to be drunk with wine. Peter described this set of people in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. He said they have pursued a course of sensuality, lust, and drunkenness. We live in a time and in a world. Where people just say, I don't do God. I just do me. It is me that is important. If I like it, I go for it. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. Pleasure. Pleasure. It's pleasure that will make you see something. You bought a drink. They wrote it there very big. And they said, this is not good for your health. And you will still keep drinking it. It takes pleasure for you to buy cigarettes and buy... Somebody said, they don't even take cigarettes again. And by marijuana or whatever it is, and you see it on the carton, it's written really smokers are liable to die young. But you know, because of the high, you are subject to pleasure. You are a son and a daughter of pleasure, not a son and daughter of God. You've sold yourself to pleasure. You are an hedonist. I'm sure you know people like that. I don't want to believe people like that are sitting here. <laughs> so I want to say, I, I'm sure you know people like that. Somebody say, I, I can have sex. She be is my body. They do not know God, neither do they want anything with him. Therefore, they do not know grace. Somebody, that's the first set of people. Let me quickly tell you the second set of people you'll find on the surface of the earth. Have you met Indonesians before? People who live for pleasure? Have you? Then the second set of people, they are the fourth finders. These are religious people. They believe in God, yes. But they believe it is their calling to save God. They believe it is their calling to save God and to save the gospel. They are the modern day fashion of the school of the Pharisees. They are self-justified and self-righteous. In fact, I call them members of the CIA of heaven. 
when somebody comes to church in a way, and the person, I can my yakambala with locks. They say, ah. <laughs> they, they, nobody will hear this thing. This guy is saying, ah, ah, you sat down and you use egg to make your hair as a ma. Your hair is standing like this now, and you are praying. <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, Paul wrote a section of his letter concerning them. Let me show you that. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. He said, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge, another you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge... Who judge those practices, such things, and doing the same that you escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? These kind of people are the people who can tell you a million things that are wrong with the church. You know, I was, I was born in the church, I was raised in the church, but church has changed. It's not what it used to be. Now it's about money. See, if you have that kind of call, Come, I'll pray for you. You go and start a church today. So that you can see how easy it is. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that they are critical people. They are fault finders. They are judges of other people's matter. But this is the problem. Whether you are self-righteous or whether you are not, you can't get to God by yourself. Whether... Those who do right, those who don't do right, none of us can get to God by ourselves. And I want to show that. Can I have two people come? Maybe a tall person and a short person. Should they call your name now? Should they call your name? Amen. It's not too low. How many do you? The height is not so. The difference is not so much. So this is it. I want you to do something. So here is a righteous guy. He has lived right all his life. Lived right all his life. He has done well all his life. He has never fornicated. He doesn't know what that nonsense is about. Understand that he has lived well, living in love, not angry with anybody. But the problem is that even him cannot get to God by all that he has done. And this is him. Bad boy. He's done everything terrible you can think of. The problem is that this man is closer to God than this man. But this man still did not reach God. Let me prove it for you in an example. Man of God, jump and touch this thing. Let's see how high you can go. No, no, go, go, go back. From there, jump. Did you see he went so high? Jump. Jump, jump. <laughs> ah, no, no. Run back and jump. You jump today. If you fall down here, we'll raise you up. Go. Who went higher? Him. <laughs> now, he went higher, but did he touch it? The higher you go, you see we not touch God without Christ. No matter how much your self-righteousness is, uh, it is not enough. Without Christ, Christ is now the ladder that ensures that by climbing this ladder, so what he has to do, if I tell him to climb this speaker and touch this place, he'll be able to touch it. Why? Because there's an elevation. The elevation we all need to touch God is Christ. No matter how much you try, no matter how good you are, no matter how awesome your right living is, uh, without Jesus, it is nothing. That is grace. The next time you pray, thinking that because you have fasted this week, God will hear you more. You are wasting your time. The only access to God is Christ. Do you get it now? Please be seated. These people say, you aren't good enough. You aren't measure up. <laughs> and let me tell you the third kind of people. They are the moralists. Sorry, the legalist. The third set of people are the legalist. I oh, see that many believers are in that school. The legalists. For them, it's self salvation. They agree they are saved by grace, but they believe they keep their salvation by works. 
Do you know that believers believe that they are saved by grace? But believers believe that to keep their salvation, they have to work. What you did not get by work, how do you think you will keep it by works? Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, by grace are ye saved. True faith. It is not your doings. The Bible says it is the gift of God. They live righteously. But listen to this. Anytime your righteousness becomes the basis of your work with God, then you are a legalist. Every time your righteousness, your self-righteousness uh, becomes the basis of your work with God, you are a legalist. Let me break it down so you get it. If you start telling yourself, if I do this, God will accept me. If I go to church, God will accept me. If I pray for six hours every day for the next six months, then my miracle will happen. You are depending on that rigor more than the sacrifice of Calvary. If I give this money, God will bless me. Oh, when you give a millionaire, you have, you, have, you have broken with poverty forever. What makes you break out from poverty forever is the gift of Christ. It's not what you give. Actually, it is good to give, but what you give must come from the understanding that Jesus has already completed the work. It is love that funnel and channel our giving. Not that we give so that we can be blessed. We are already the blessed of God. Somebody listen to what I'm saying. Paul spoke about these people. He said they rest in the law. Romans 2.17 You know what? If you keep all the law and miss one, you are a sinner. <laughs> I think that's awesome. It makes that law thing very crazy, right? So that in God's book, Somebody who lied and an homosexual is the same thing. But in the eyes of church goers, it's not the same thing. Liar is better. Oh. That homo, homo, homo. In God's book, you all are sinners. What takes you from that point of being a sinner to the point of receiving grace? The bridge is only covered by the cross of his son, Jesus. Anytime you step out to God, anytime you call out to God, and you are standing on the basis of what you have collected, what you have prayed, how you have walked with God, the mountain you have traversed, you have missed it. It has to be Jesus. Because your son died, I am able. Because your son died, I am able. It's really just godlessness. And here is the conclusion about those first three people. And I need you to know it. Number one is that the first set of people indulge their passion. They are hedonist. They serve pleasure. The second monitors their neighbor. <laughs> that girl does not pray as you used to pray. As she has gotten a job now. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, she will soon backslide. You will see. That is those second people. They monitor their neighbor. They don't think about their own life. They are not concerned about their place. They are not concerned about their work with God. Their job as members of the CIA of heaven, of the protocol of heaven, is to ensure that everybody falls in line. How can you be a pastor? Can you be a pastor and you have dreads? How can a pastor be wearing two rings? You see, that's it. Those pastors, they are finished. They are the ones destroying Christianity. Do I agree with all of those things? My personal opinion. But it's not a scriptural opinion. But when you go around judging your neighbor, Jesus said, first of all, remove the lumbar of tree in your eyes. Before you talk about the speck in somebody else's eyes. The reason Christians are not gracious is because Christians are legalists in heart. They are grace people in their salvation experience. So when I got saved, I believe in grace. So when I make a call, an altar call, I ask you, and I say to you, do you believe and confess Jesus as Lord? If you believe that you are saved, we we'll believe it. And then we say we are saved. You didn't do anything. But what makes you think that to receive a job from God, you have to do anything? 
If by grace you receive salvation, by grace you will also receive every other thing from God. That's why grace is so powerful. Does it now cancel works? No, we have to walk. But our work is from the basis of being accepted. We are not working to be accepted in the beloved. I hope I'm not going too deep. I'm trying to... I could have started from another theological grace, but I'm trying to let you understand. And then the fourth kind of people are the grace-dependent people. Give me Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I think I've quoted it before. Ephesians chapter 2, and then verse 8. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved. For by what are you saved? Can I hear you shout it? Are you what? For by grace are you what? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you know the word save? Do you know the meaning of the word save? The Greek for that word is the word zozo. Which is spelled S-O-Z-O. And that's the word that was used in that verse of scriptures. And it says, and that's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Right? Zozo actually is that word that means five. And some theology, theologians believe it means seven things. That word zozo means deliverance. It means out. It means safety. It means prosperity. And then it means salvation. So if by grace you are saved, by grace you will also be delivered. Do you understand that? If by grace you are saved, by grace, you will also receive other gift from God. The Bible says, not of yourself, it is the gift of God, right? Therefore, everything you receive from God, it will not be because you deserve it. It will be by His grace. Somebody listen to me. I receive it by grace. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and then verse 17, Scripture says, every good gift, every perfect gift come from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. It means that every good gift you will ever want, you may ever need, every good gift that is your portion, every good gift that you want, is what? Is what? So can I ask you, what are the gifts you have been asking God for? Husband? You know when I was growing up, I believe it was beautiful people that used to get married. But then I go and, and, and I grew up and I, and I found out there are very ugly people who are marrying very handsome brothers. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then I see that there are beautiful ladies who are getting to 35, 40. And I'm like, ah. So my theory is not true. A good wife is a gift from God. You choose by your sightings, you may suffer all your life. But when you depend on him to give you, you may enjoy all your life. A good job is by grace. I don't know what you came in here with asking the Lord, but I've come to give you the answer. It's grace that will help you get it. Somebody say, all I want is promotion. All I want is lifting. I'm saying to you that you can fast is okay. You can pray is okay. But the basis of ever receiving anything from God is grace. Help me preach to your neighbor. I say the basis of ever receiving anything from God is grace. So people who understand grace, they know it's good to pray more. They know they fast more than others. They pray more than others. Not because they are unworthy, but because God has forgiven them so much. So that they love him so much. And here is where I end. Here is where another story comes in. Give me, let's read together Luke chapter 15. And it's quite long reading. Luke 15, 11 to 24. Let's consider the story of the prodigal. And I want to tie all of it together today. If you look at the story that we have, read, we have looked at, we've seen that man, Jeffrey Dahmer. The legalist would have said, 
Oh, even if he says he's safe, he's not safe, though. <laughs> God cannot save that kind of a person. A monster, a cannibal, legalists will say it's not possible. The internist will say he does not even need God in the first place. There's no God. Why is he giving his life to Christ? He had made his choices while he was alive. Let's continue with his choices. And the critical people will say, are you even sure he was saved? Because he said it and he went to church. What if he was lying? But those who depend on grace understand that if grace saved that man on the cross, he can save Jeffrey Dama. They understand that if grace saved them, they themselves, they were not better than Jeffrey Dama. We all are sinners. Without Christ, we will still remain in our sins. And the blood of the lamp is sufficient enough. I don't know what you have done in your past. I don't know what keep telling you in your head and saying to you, you can never measure up. And God can take care of everything, but not this one. Not this one. I've come to tell you that Jeffrey Dama found Christ. I've come to tell you that the thief, the kakugos, the criminal condemned on the cross find Christ. If he can, you also can. Proverbs, sorry, Luke 15 and 11 to 24. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to live to them his livelihood. And not many days after the younger son, it's always the younger sons, gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and they wasted his possession with prodigal living. How many of you know that firstborns are always loyal? Mm. But when he has spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to his feet to feed swine. I hope you know what swine means. Pigs. And he will gladly fill his stomach with the pot that the swine ate. Imagine you have become so low that you are eating pig's food. And no one <laughs> gave him anything. You see, when a life is without grace, he has nothing. Scripture says, and no man gave him anything. When you are in that situation where you say, no man has ever given me anything before. I work for everything in my life. You need a prayer point from today. And it's to say, Lord, let your grace fall upon me. Let your grace come upon me. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's house have and have bread enough and to spare? I perish with hunger, I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the higher servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best rope and put it on him. Put a ring on his right hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fat calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Notice the father never even asked, what happened to your life? What did you do with your life? Uh, notice the father never even said, how much money did I give you? Where did you keep it? Uh, is it the investment went wrong? Notice the father never said, uh, how did you leave me? Why did you leave me? So to ask, Bamba, have you learned anything at all? The father said nothing in that way. He said, the Bible says the man was coming. You know how you come home when you have done wrong as a child? You want to hide home. You want to just, uh, so that nobody knows, you sneak into the house. Uh, and as he was coming, thinking, what will I say to the father? Scripture says the father ran to him. It's not what you have done. It's you coming home. And I believe there are parallels from the story of the prodigal son. And I want to draw three parallels here today as we round off this. Number one is that the prodigal son was self-willed, self-assured, and self-driven. The prodigal son was self-willed, self-assured, and self-driven. He thought he could live his life without the direction and the leadership of the father. Help me, Jack, and everyone says he's telling you about the prodigal son. 
Jack your neighbor, Jack your neighbor, Jack your neighbor. He's telling you about the prodigal son. He didn't want to be under the authority of the father. He followed his own way. He demanded his own freedom. And many of us are like that. We have chosen a life outside of God. We thought we can do life without him. We thought by ourselves we can live. But like the prodigal, we also have been beaten. We have been tortured by life. We have lost money. We have lost our relationships. We've probably lost our virginity. We've lost our health. And we have wasted our time. How was he to know that his search for freedom will cost him so much loss and pain? How was he to know that in your search, how are you to know that in your search for freedom, for liberty, you are going to become addicted to a substance? How are you to know that destruction and rejection and addiction and pain will follow that part of freedom? Listen, what most people call life this day is what scripture refers to as riotous living. Let me say this to you without any fear of contradiction. No one can do life the way it is ordained without God. No one can do life the way it is ordained without God. Rebellion against God doesn't arm God. Neither does he arm the church. It destroys you. That young boy rebelled against the father. And he thought he was going to harm the father. But at the end of the day, he was harming himself. Many of us have rebelled against God. We have told God it does not count. We have told God it does not matter. We have told God, I don't want to be under your authority anymore. I want to live my life by myself. Look at where he has led you. You've lost time. The last time you remember yourself, it was seven years ago. You've lost your virginity in just testing waters. Men have hurt you. Women have hurt you. You have lost money. You have lost investment. Why? Because you are self-willed, self-driven, and self-assured. That's the first parallel. And then I saw the second parallel. He settled for a life that was beneath him. And this is the most important and the most painful contrast in this story. That a prince will settle for the life of a slave. He began to feed pigs. I call it the pig life. But I think our generation call it the shit life. Many of us are living life. And the best way to describe it. Forget the manicure, the makeup, how you came to church this morning. Is that it is shit. Look at your life. See where your rebellion has led you. I don't want to follow the God of my fathers. I don't want to follow the God of my mother. I don't want anybody to lie to them in church. I'm going to do my life myself. Right now, you cannot even control yourself from taking a bottle of alcohol. It's substance that controls you. A lady moves by. You are aroused. Why? Because you are subjected to that flesh. You are in bondage. You are in pain. Somebody say, get him a woman. Let him marry. No, sir. No, ma. Marriage is not a cure to lust. Self-control is. Look at your life. You should have lived a better life. But you have become a victim of your choices. Your choice to set aside the ways of God. Your choice not to be diligent in school. Your choice to use your body the way you want it. Your choice to abandon God and abandon the church. Your choice to turn your back against the Father. It has brought you here. This is not the best life. This is not the life God wants for you. Is there somebody here who is saying, I am bored. I feel used. I am tired. I feel abandoned. I can't take this anymore. I've been trying but I don't want to do it again. I feel empty. I don't have anything. Oh God, I'm done. Then God sent me to you this morning. Because the third parallel, and it's the most important parallel, 
is that this man remembered that the grace of the father is greater. The prodigal son remembered that the grace of the father is greater. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sins. He went to the Father. He remembered that even the servants in his father's house live better lives. The least he could ever be in the father's house was better than the best that the world was offering him. He went back home thinking, let me just be a servant. He went back home, but the father ran to him. The father gave him the best robe and gave him the ring, the ring of honor, of authority. He didn't have to do anything. He only had to acknowledge that he had lived in hell. He only had to acknowledge that the father is still his father. We came to church today. He said, I'm just going to have here. I don't know why I came. Some of you are regretting that you came right now. I don't know why I came. But you came because the father's love is drawing you. Are you here and these stories fit you? You are saying, you know what? I'm not completely a prodigal. I'm a fault finder. I'm a legalist. I'm a hedonist. All I say to you is come to Jesus. And you are there saying, PFA, I've done crazy stuff. And my answer is simple. Come. For his grace is greater. Come. For his grace is greater. Wherever you are on that side of my voice, will you rise on your feet? Please close your eyes, everyone. You're saying, you know what? I know I've lived such a life. But God's grace is greater. But His grace is greater. I'm going to make a call this morning. And all through this night, I was praying for you. And I don't want to make this call for those who are sinners. I just want to make this call for everyone who knows and who believes that right now I need Jesus more than ever before. Somebody will say, you know, I just want to come to the Father. If he can do anything with this mess, let him fix it. If he can do anything, I have, I've tried my best. I've done my, I've done my best. My career is good. But these other sides are not working. Acknowledge is not working. Lord, I'll come. And we're just going to sing a song this morning. You may not know the song. But I'm going to do it the way I saw it. If you are saying, I want to come home to God. I'm not going to make a call and say, raise your hand. No. As we begin to sing that song, just come to the altar and just kneel down at this altar and just begin to speak to God. This is you taking steps to God. This is you saying, I'm handing that thing over. Listen to this. I don't, I don't, I don't want to care what people here think about you. But today is the day of your answer. I labored in prayers for you today. That the grace of God will fix you. That the grace of God will fix every area of that life. Every area where you have been struggling. It doesn't matter whether you are a leader. It doesn't matter who you are in this house. It doesn't matter. If there is such a mess, there is something you just know. I need him. I need him. Close your eyes. Nobody looking around. Just focus on Jesus. You can just begin to come. You can just begin to come.
stand helpless vulnerable are you coming to him are you coming to him I sense an anointing here. Child, be bold and come. Hey! Father, here I am. <laughs> Yes, of my soul. Yes, yes. He's a love God to you. Some people still have to be here. Just come. Just come. We're not keeping records. Do I stand? Helpless, vulnerable. Helpless. Vulnerable. In love, My state, ah, Jesus, Jesus, to me, start be bold and come. Yes, Father, here, here I am. Here I am. Fix me. Fix me, Lord. Fix me, Lord. Hey! Such a well. Such a well. Such a well. Drink from this well. Just say, fix me, Lord. Just say, fix me, Lord. <laughs> to your grace, I pour it all. I exchange my weakness for your grace. It's okay to cry, don't worry. It's the presence of your Father. This is home. <laughs> Let's take that English again from the beginning. In the stillness of my soul, In the stillness of my soul is a loud cry to you. Let no sapiato before you, my stand. I stand helpless and vulnerable. Helpless. Vulnerable. Onward is my state. Onward is my state. Because your love says to me. Ah, this is what the love of God says. Child, be bold and come, Father. Here I am. What is my say? Hello, Shapale, Krapo, Saniana, no Saba. What's your love to I'll be bold and come. Be bold and come. Father. Father. Here I am. If you can do anything with this vessel. 